Hello, everyone. I hope you are doing well. So we are very glad to start the TEFL seminar. It's about empowering our new certified teachers. And uh, Ms. Islam and I will be in charge of today's seminar. And we have uh, five great certified teachers who are going to share with you very interesting presentations. All of them are about English language teaching. So after they completed the 120 hour TEFL course that was organized by Global Bus Foundation, the Chicasso Academy and the Canadian Academy. Now we are empowering them to present their um, presentations. All right, great. So let me give the floor to our moderator of today's seminar, Ms. Islam Qasmi. But before giving the floor to Ms. Islam, let me introduce and give you some information about Islam Qasimi. So Islam Qasimi is one of the leaders of Global Bus Foundation. She is a teacher and a trainer, and she had the master degree two years ago and now continuing her PhD studies. It's, it's her second year. She has trained um, teachers, prospective teachers, trainees, okay, uh, not only in Rabat, but in Rabat, Sali, and in Agadir as well. So she is a very active member at Global Bus Foundation. Yes, Ms. Islam, the floor is yours if you can hear me. Yes, I can hear you. Um, hello, everybody. Right. First, yes. Hello, everybody, and welcome to this webinar. Wonderful. First of all, Thank you so much, Mr. Al Hussein, for this uh, presentation, for introducing me to the GBF audience. And uh, I hope you are all safe and sound and healthy, you and your families. I know we are all going through this very tough uh, times with the COVID-19, and I wish you all you are happy and healthy. So uh, first of all, we welcome you if you are a new audience to our uh, one of our one of a kind, it's actually one of a kind webinars because uh, our certified teachers are going to talk and our, are going to share with us uh, their wonderful presentations and talks related to the field of EFL or teaching English as a foreign language. Also, we are, you are welcome and we are happy that you are with us, our uh, old audience or loyal audience because you have always uh, attended and you have always been interested in attending and assisting our offline and online uh, webinars and our online conferences, study days and uh, workshops. So before we start, before I introduce to you our presenters, let me first remind you of our uh, objective and our aim at Global Bus Foundation. As you all know, Global Bus Foundation is a non-governmental organization uh, aiming at empowering both youth and teachers. So uh, we do this, we empower youth and teachers via organizing so many conferences, study days and workshops inside Morocco and outside Morocco. We, in the past five years, we have worked with or we have had the chance to present uh, all over Morocco. We had the chance to present in the north of Morocco. So we went to Martil, Tetuan, Tangier. Also, we had a chance to present in the south of Morocco. We had the chance to um, present and empower teachers uh, uh, in Agadir, Marrakesh, in Tiznit, and also the west of Morocco, here in uh, Rabat, in Sali, in Kenetra, in Al Jadida, in Casablanca, and so many other cities. Of course, we have in mind and we have in plan that we are going to go to the east of Morocco in Wajda and Saidia. We have discussed this and uh, uh, we are going to go there soon, inshallah. Not only our objective is to, is to empower teachers nationally in Morocco, but also internationally. For this, we have have had the chance to empower and present and enlighten our international audience in Tunisia, Turkey, in uh, France, Spain, China, and so many other countries. We were planning to go 
this year, but unfortunately, because of the COVID-19, we couldn't go, but we had um, the chance to present online webinars in our, uh, the first international Rabat conference. So uh, one of our objective as GBF leaders is, as I said, empower teachers and educators. For this, we have designed, uh, for this we have designed, or we are organizing the TEFL course. Uh, we have 120 hours TEFL course uh, in partnership with the Tokoso Academy in Agdal Rabat. And we offer online and offline in class, of course, in class class, in class uh, courses and lessons and online via Zoom classes. During the summer, we had a special uh, alumna. We, five of them are here with us today. And we offered them uh, the 120 hours TEFL course. They have learned a lot about how to teach English um, as, a, as a foreign language, of course. In this alumna, we had uh, different students from Morocco and outside Morocco. We had uh, the, uh, the chance to uh, to give them or to empower them with the theory and the practice. Uh, you may ask me, how did you empower online students with practice? Yes, they had the chance to practice teaching uh, because they, they, they used to teach each other or what we call by online micro teaching. And uh, uh, they used to use what they have learned in order to teach each other English. And it was a fruitful uh, experience for them. Uh, the objective of this course is to give our, or to, for our trainees to become certified teachers. By the end of the program, they can teach anywhere. By anywhere, I'm not, saying that they can go to the US or to the UK or a native speaking English country, they can. It's very hard there to teach English using a TEFL course, but of course they can teach in Asia, they can teach in Europe, they can teach in Morocco or in their native countries, uh, uh, teaching English for a foreign, as, as a foreign language, of course. So today's event is going to be full of uh, amazing, talented, uh, presentations presented by our TEFL trainees and our alumna because they have just graduated from their program and they are full of energy, full of knowledge, and uh, they would love to uh, transmit to the, uh, the GBF audience, of course. So uh, let me now uh, introduce you to our five speakers. Uh, the first one is going to be Yusuf uh, Yusuf Asfar. He's going to talk about uh, integrating the four skills in the AFL ESL context or class. Why should we integrate the four skills? How can we integrate it? And uh, he's going to give us some examples of a very successful integration of the, the, the four skills in one setting. So welcome Yusuf. Next speaker is going to be Mariam Shamu. Mariam Shamu is going to talk about more or less the same topic as Yusuf. So she's going to talk about integrating skills. Is it important? She's going to talk about the reasons. Why do we have to integrate skills? Or why do we have not to integrate skills? Because this is another option. So uh, integrate skills in EFL classes. Why do we have to integrate it? Uh, is it important? Give reasons and how, of course, we can integrate these skills. The third speaker, she, she, she has come all the way from Iran, Mohadiz Movahdi. She's going to talk about assessment and testing, another very important block that teachers uh, should know about and before administering or before designing any test, they should know why first, why do we have to test our students? Uh, is it to get grades, to give them good grades or what? 
like why testing and Mahari, she's going to tell us more and answer this question. Also, she's going to speak about the dichotomy of NRT versus CRT, which is very important to know about. Also, she's going to talk more about test functions, summative versus formative assessment, speed tests and power tests, also, she's going to uh, uh, introduce us to the main, as I tell all the time, these are the main concepts in testing and in assessment that every, every teacher should know, which are reliability, practicality, authenticity, validity, and washback or backwash. It depends on the literature. So some people, they call it washback. Some other scholars, they, they refer to it as backwash. Uh, our fourth speaker, Fatima Zahrawardi, is going to enlighten us about how we can use public speaking and debates in EFL classes. How can you uh, make use of Public speaking, as we know, is a very good way to make students practice speaking. But how can you use it in your AFL classes apart from clubs? We know that some schools, they have a public speaking club, but that's another issue. Fatima Zahrawardi is going to tell us how can you use your, the, the first 10 minutes of your class or the last 10 minutes of your class and make use of public speaking and debating and making your EFL classes a successful one or a wonderful one. The last, last and not least, our speaker, Maryam Khurshi, she's going to talk about another very important topic which is neuroscience and education. What is neuroscience and what is education and how can we uh, make use of both concepts in our EFL class? These are the topics that our estimated speakers and uh, TEFL course alumna are going to, to speak about today. Uh, before giving the floor to our first speaker, Youssef, let me first, um, uh, welcome them and uh, uh, congratulate them for their certificate that they've just got. Uh, just to mention that the 120 TEFL course is not only targeted for novice or pre-service teachers, teachers who have never been to any TEFL course before, or only students who want to carry or uh, um, a career in education, but also it's a this is also targeted for in service teachers. If you uh, if you have been teaching for ten years or five years or twenty years, it doesn't matter because a perfect teacher never exists. As for your teacher development program, you need you are in need of such uh, programs such as our uh, TEFL one hundred twenty hours program to uh, uh, reshape uh, your teaching skills to learn more about what is new in the English literature. As you know, English pedagogy or teaching English as a foreign language pedagogy is revolving every day and evolving every day. We every day uh, have new topics, new uh, games to use in your classes, new concepts related to testing, to teaching, to lesson planning to uh, educational psychology, how you can deal with your students. And this is another part of our 120 course. Uh, and you can join us be, if you are a novice teacher or in uh, pre-service teacher, you can join us anytime you want. And if you are in service, make sure to join us because you need, you really need our course for your future professional development. So uh, just to remind our speakers today, we you each one of you will have 20 minutes and uh, I will remind you uh, five minutes before the time. And uh, um, this is it. Let's start with Yusuf. Yusuf, can you please start with first introducing yourself? Then you can go on with your presentation. The floor is yours, Yusuf. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. I hope you are doing well today and you have an amazing day. So my name is Yusuf Asfar, a bachelor degree in linguistic studies. And so far, I have participated in the 120-hour TFL program organized by the Global Best Foundation and 
Tikosa Academy and the Canadian Academy for Training and Consulting. So uh, today I will talk about the, uh, an interesting topic, which uh, is about integrating the four skills in EFL and the ESL classes. Okay, can I share my slide? Okay, uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, the Global Bus Foundation and its person, Mr. Lahoussin Qasiras, for giving us the opportunity to uh, participate in this seminar in LT. And I would like to thank the Global Bus Foundation and the Chikose Academy and the Canadian Academy for the wonderful program, the amazing program we have. Uh, we have came to know many, uh, many things, many things related to the teaching of English. We have come to know the approaches, the methods, uh, and the skills that the teacher needs to, to teach the, uh, the students in an effective way. So as I said, my uh, presentation will be about integrating the four skills in EFL ESL classes. So this uh, topic is, uh, important and at the same time is challenging. It is important because nowadays we need uh, to integrate the four skills in our class. Teacher needs to uh, needs to, 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 to have the four skills to, into, uh, to teach the four skills in the class and integrate them uh, in the class to, to have a uh, uh, because nowadays we need to, to sit communication in the class. Students need to communicate fluently, need to use the four skills all together in the class. And uh, the topic is uh, the integrating of the four skills is challenging because uh, student teacher need time, need a lot of preparation and they have to be well experienced to integrate the four skills in the EFL, in EFL classes. So my uh, presentation, the outline of my presentation will be, first I will talk about uh, an introduction then I will define the integrative skill. What do we mean by integrating the skills? Uh, and we'll see what is integration skill about and why do we need to integrate the four skills, the reason behind integrating the four skills, and how to integrate the four skills in the AFL classes or ASL classes. I will talk also about the implication or the advantages for teaching the four skills, and also the limitation or the challenges of integrating the four skills. And then I will conclude by a brief conclusion to sum up the whole idea about the topic. So in the real life, uh, we use more than one language to communicate. So we simultaneously use more than one language scale for communication. So uh, people needs to needs more than one scale to communicate. So in the class, the teacher needs to integrate the four skills and focus in the uh, realistic language that I have to sit communication and uh, help student to communicate during the class using the language uh, effectively and, and using it uh, to communicate. So students need to expose to natural language. They need to uh, expose to language inside the class and the outside the class. They need to transfer what they learn inside the class to the outside class. So communication by definition requires the interaction of the main language skills. In integrated skills instruction, learners are exposed to uh, authentic language and are involved in uh, activities that are meaningful and uh, interesting. So teachers nowadays have, have been studying the ways of uh, enabling learners to use English 
freely, to use it freely and effectively and as far as possible uh, accurately when dealing with grammar. So in realistic communication, which has become not only the major goal of all English language teaching, but also for students' main uh, concern uh, when they make their efforts to study the language. So here we talk about integrating the four skills, emphasize the focus on realistic language and can help develop communicative competence among the learners of English. So here, the keywords, uh, we talk about uh, using English in natural, in, in the real life uh, and to, to use the skills to communicate and communicate effectively. So as you can see here from the picture here, so all the skills you need to succeed. So students need more than one language. They need uh, the four skills all together and the three aspects. So they need reading. So as much students exposed to reading texts, exposed to text and uh, they, the more they, they will be able to write, the more they will be able to produce, to produce uh, uh, sentences, produce paragraphs and uh, to compose paragraphs and, uh, and essays. So the reading serves the writing as much learners uh, read as much they go to, uh, to be able to write effectively. And uh, also we talk about listening. Uh, listening serves the speaking. So as much students uh, uh, exposed to listening, for example, to recording types, as much they will able to speak. So uh, all the skills, uh, these all skills, reading, I mean reading, uh, speaking, listening and writing, that uh, students need all these skills and the three aspects, that is to say grammar, uh, vocabulary and pronunciation during the class instruction. So what do we mean by integrated skills? We have to define this, uh, the term integrated skill. So integrating skills is, refers to the interaction, the interaction, the combination of the four main language skills, that is to say, reading, listening, speaking, and writing, uh, all together during instruction, during the class. So students need to, to use the four skills in the class, they need to interact uh, interact during the class. Also integrating skills is a combination or is a, uh, a mixture, a combination uh, of two or more skills within a communicative task. Here we talk about the communicative task. We talk about tasks that uh, help students to communicate, helps them to use the language effectively uh, during the, the class and during activities. So in the real life uh, communication cannot take place unless the skills are integrated. So integrating the skill is important to uh, make students uh, use the language, use the reading, the listening, the speaking and the writing, uh, get to know the four skills are together uh, during the class and outside the class. So in integrating skills, uh, I will talk about circuitations. Uh, the first one, uh, uh, Young, 2006, and Nonan David, 1989. So the first one, they said that integrating the full skills emphasizes the focus on realistic language, the real language, the natural language, and can therefore lead to the students' all around development of communicative competence. Uh, Concerning David, 1989, he believed that skill integration to be an effective, to be an important feature of language learning, uh, which appears to interaction, as we already explained, and task continuity. So the, the skills are interrelated in each other to, uh, teacher should design a task that, uh, that helps students get to know the, the skills, how to, to read, uh, how to use reading, how to write and how to listen effectively on how to speak. And 
uh, real world focus learning and learning focus and task outcomes. So here we talk, when we talk about language skill, we talk about the receptive skills and the productive skills. So in the receptive skills, uh, reading and listening and the productive skills when students produce the language they speak or write. And the receptive skills when the student receive information, the inputs. So as you can notice here, so the receptive skills, uh, listening and reading. So the listening and reading serves as the input. So students uh, get information from the teacher, uh, receive uh, information, then produce then in the coming uh, coming task they produce the skills they produce the out the outputs so we talk about when we talk about productive skill we talk about speaking and writing so reading serves the uh, writing and listening serves the speaking they are interrelated each other so this receptive skills as an input serve the productive skills as the output as much students uh, exposed to uh, the input, as much they will be able to produce the language, to produce utter the uh, the produce the language and uh, produce the outputs. They could speak effectively and write uh, a good writing. So, in the second thing, we will see uh, what is integration skill about. So. Integration skill about is about five main things. The first thing integration skill is about linking, to link the four skills, to link the four skills up together in, during the class, during the lesson. Uh, second thing integration skill is about addressing, uh, addressing the different learning styles, the students' different learning styles. And in the class, we have different uh, different students. Some students are uh, verbal, and some students are auditory learners, uh, and some are visual learners. So, integrating the four skills uh, address is addressing the different le learning styles, the different abilities of students. The third thing is that integrating skills uh, help us to create. Uh, a learning, a, a, a positive learning environment. Uh, and in uh, a class where there is fun, we should, uh, we should have create fun uh, during the class, during the, the lesson, so as not students get bored and uh, we're not able to, to, to have more information during the class. So we, the teacher need to create a positive learning environment a good, uh, a good, a positive uh, learning environment. So the first thing, the first, uh, the fourth thing is that integration skill is about to suit. So to suit uh, the different classes, the small classes and the large classes. So it is not uh, fair that to say that integration skills is only uh, suitable for the small classes but also it is, uh, it is suitable for the large classes and it, it serves, integrating skills serves the both of them, the small classes and the large classes. So when we link and address and create, and then we suit the different classes, so we come to the final uh, things, the final product, which means uh, students will be able to master the language. They will get to know uh, the master to, to master the language, to master the skills, to have uh, an idea about all skills, the four skills and the three aspects. So here, as uh, we can see, uh, we talked about in the previous uh, previous slide. So we we'll skip it. So integrating skills is about linking and dressing, uh, sorting and mastering. So uh, why do we need to integrate the four skills? The reason behind integrating the four skills. So as we can, we have said uh, already, so the reading and speaking, writing and listening 
are interrelated. They cannot separate it. If we separate one scale from the other or segregate one scale from the other, uh, students will not be able to uh, follow and we, we, uh, we segregate skills from the other. So the four skills need to be uh, interrelated, need to be uh, taught in the class altogether. So the first thing, uh, when we integrate the four skills, students interact naturally and uh, learn real content. So when students, so students exposed to a natural language and develop communicative skills and practice language in a real life situation. So we're talking about real content or real life situation. Students need to interact naturally and learn to use the, uh, the skills inside the class and outside the class. Number two, students are exposed to authentic language and can use English effectively for communication. Uh, learners, uh, here learners are exposed to authentic language and uh, are involved in activities that uh, are meaningful and interesting. So students need to, uh, to expose to authentic language and to use the, uh, and the, the main idea is to use the English effectively for communication. They, uh, when they complete the lesson, when they finish the lesson, they will, uh, they will be able to communicate, they will be able to use the language uh, effectively. So uh, when integrating the skills, integration task, uh, integration leads to task continuity. So as you can see here in the picture, uh, so the, the, the four skills are interrelated, uh, they are uh, bound together, they are as a chain cycle. If we break down the one cycle from one chain or one ring from the cycle, from the cycle way, the, the whole thing collapse. So when we separate one skill from the other, we, we don't have the, uh, the task continuity. So the task continuity or the chaining of activity together to form a sequence. So one skill can reinforce uh, another, as we can, uh, as we have said. So reading serve the writing and listening serve the speaking. They are related, and each skill reinforces the other. Uh, we learn to speak. Students learn to speak by what the but what uh, what they hear, and we learn to write but what we read. So reading serve the writing, and listening serve the speaking. So the four skills are interrelated and cannot isolated or cannot separated. We cannot talk about reading without speaking or without listening and without writing. Okay. So uh, here we talk about how to integrate the four skills. So to, uh, there is uh, two different ways to two different ways to integrate the four, uh, the four skills. It exists the simple integration and the complex integration. In the simple integration, uh, the teacher moves from the receptive skills from the, uh, I mean, the less challenging uh, skills to the productive skills, which is the most challenging uh, skills. So the, the teacher moves from the reading and listening to writing and speaking. So the simple integration occurs within the same medium, either oral or written. So in the complex uh, integration, uh, we combine uh, or we join, uh, we, we join and combine and mix all the skill together. So for example, the students uh, will uh, read a text uh, about a certain topic, then they go to uh, to the comprehensive uh, questions they have to write, they have to answer the comprehensive question, and then maybe they will discuss uh, with their partners. They, they, uh, they pair and share uh, their uh, answers together, so they speak. And uh, maybe a teacher will invite students to the board, for example, to uh, let them the chance to 
to talk about the topic, to describe, for example, the pictures, what they see in the picture, uh, to build uh, as a building interest. So they speak. So the complex integration is we combine uh, and we mix the all skill together. Uh, we vary material, we vary the skills. So we talk about reading, we can integrate reading, speaking, listening, and uh, writing in one or two activities. So here we will talk about implications or advantages for teaching the four skills. What is the advantage, advantages? So when we communicate, we often use more, one, uh, more than one language, more than one skills. So for example, when we talk uh, in, in the phone, for example, we talk, uh, we communicate with uh, someone. So we talk in the phone and at the same time we listen and maybe uh, we can take notes for an address, for example, or a phone a number, for example. So we need, we use uh, the, the, all the skills uh, together in, in, uh, in, one, in one time, okay? So integrating the full scale is concerned with realistic communication, the real communication or the natural communication. So the second thing is adjusting the textbook content. So the teacher needs to adjust to modify the textbook content. Uh, teachers should not be a slave to the textbook. He should uh, bring uh, materials, bring uh, activities, uh, bring activities to uh, modify, to, uh, to integrate uh, activities that uh, we find all the skills together. They have to modify the content. For example, some uh, textbook uh, do not cover the all skills. So they, have, uh, they might miss uh, one of the skills. So the teacher needs to be flexible, need to adapt, to adjust, to modify the content and also to modify the timetable. Uh, modify the timetable, uh, teacher should, uh, I mean, should uh, adjust the activities and, and make uh, time for each skill. He should be uh, flexible in using the time in uh, teaching the skills. He should, uh, I mean, he should, uh, respect the time and uh, give much time to each skills. We should not focus about one skills, an hour, for example, teaching, uh, an hour reading, for example, and neglect the other skills. They should uh, teach the other skills, uh, should uh, adjust to the time. Uh, okay, so here I will talk about uh, Carl, and he talk about some advantages of integrating the four skills. Uh, Carol 1999 describes some advantages or some implication of integrating uh, the I'm four sorry skills. Sorry to interrupt you, yeah, yes. Yusuf. Okay. I'm sorry to interrupt you, but you still have five minutes. Okay, so uh, I will be quick. Okay, thank you so much. So skills integration provide continuity in teaching learning program. Tasks are closely related to each other. So when we integrate the skills, we uh, as we said uh, already said we we provide uh, we provide continuity the task continuity uh, and the relation the shining the chaining of the activities or the relation of the activities all together so integrating the skills uh, provide the realistic learning as skills integration allows for the uh, for the student to develop the four skill within a realistic communication. So uh, in integrating the four skills, we talk about realistic learning. So when we integrate the four skills, we, we provide students with uh, realistic language, we provide students with, uh, with the with the skills that help them to communicate within the class or outside the class. A skill integration increases confidence to a weaker or less confident learners. So when we integrate skills, we provide opportunities for 
both the weaker uh, weaker students or weaker learners and for the uh, the other learners uh, they, we give them the chance to uh, to interact to to interact within the, the lesson and participate in the in the lesson. So when uh, when we deal with the weaker students, we can design activities that help the weaker students understand more. And and for the fast learners, for example, we provide them with challenges. We add challenges challenges in the activities and. So here we will talk about the limitations and the uh, disadvantages or the challenges that teacher faces during the class. So the first thing is time consuming. So when integrating the four skills, it takes time. It needs time to prepare, uh, to design lesson plans that uh, it needs a lot of preparation. Students, uh, uh, teacher have to design a good lesson plan when he introduced or he, when he uh, integrate the four skills. So teachers need to be well experienced. Uh, they need training to integrate the four skills. Not all the teachers have the ability to integrate the skills or they need training. And to, they have teacher needs a lot of flexibility. They, know, they need to be flexible in using activities in, uh, uh, in bringing the materials. They have to be flexible. So uh, in the conclusion, uh, conclusion, so I come to the end uh, of the, my presentation. So uh, integration, the, the four skills is important to understand the main purpose of integrating the four skills is the first to develop real life communication. And uh, which means that it is very important to provide students with authentic materials. Students need to, uh, teacher need to, to have uh, a good material to bring good materials uh, activities that help students integrate the four the four skills, the authentic uh, materials and create uh, create real life situations. Teacher needs to uh, create fun uh, learning environment in the class. Have a positive uh, learning environment where students can interact, explore, and discuss, and <clears throat> and also negotiate the meaning. Also, uh, when integrate the four skills, uh, we 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 help students to be fluent, to be fluent in speaking, uh, to use the language fluently and accurately uh, in using the grammar. Uh, they know in the dealing with the structure, dealing with the form, uh, and so on and so forth. So. This is my end of my presentation. Thank you so much for your attendance. Any feedbacks or comment, please welcome. Uh, ask, I'm here to answer your questions. Okay, so uh, thank, thank you, Mr. You, Islam. The floor is yours. Thank you, Youssef, for your wonderful presentation. I'm so sure it was informative and insightful. Will you please stop presenting? Can okay. you please, Youssef? Yes. Thank you. Okay, so uh, we are going to leave the discussion until the end because we have a similar uh, topic to Yusuf's, which is integrating the four skills. As Yusuf said in his presentation, uh, integrating the four skills helps students achieve communicative competence and which all students are thriving for. And that's why we actually learn English is to achieve communicative competence, to be competent as speakers of that language. And uh, Mariam Shamu, uh, let's give her the floor. She's going to talk about integrating skills and how important it is to integrate the four skills in AFL classes. Yes, Maria. Uh, Ms. Islam, before Maria yeah. Shamu, is there any question for Yusuf Asfar? Uh, th there is no question actually in the Facebook page or in the YouTube channel. And this is, again, uh, you can ask your questions either in the Facebook page, Global Bus Foundation, or in the YouTube channel in the, under like the video. And I'm going to make sure to transmit them 
to Yusuf and uh, all other speakers. I had a question of mine again, but I said I'm not going to share it with Mr. Youssef because he has a similar topic with Mariam. So let's first give the floor to Mariam to present her presentation. Then I'm going to give them like similar questions because it's more or less the same, yeah, the same. Uh, topic. Wonderful. Okay, Mariam. Yes, go you are right. Wonderful. Okay, right. Mariam, the floor is yours. Okay. You have 20 minutes. Go ahead. Okay, Islam, thank you so much. Uh, okay, uh, hello everyone. Uh, I hope you're doing well. My name is uh, Maryam Shamu, and uh, I'm a BA holder from Qadariyaz University in Marrakesh. And uh, I'm also a TEFL, uh, a certified teacher. I got my TEFL certificate from uh, the well-known uh, Global uh, Tokoso Academy and Global Bass Foundation in collaboration with uh, the Canadian Academy for Training and uh, Consulting. Uh, before I start, I would like, uh, would like uh, to uh, express my profound gratitude for uh, Mr. Hussain for his guidance uh, and um, for his uh, valuable information uh, he provided us with. Thank you so much, Mr. Hussain. Our pleasure, thanks. Let me share my screen first. Sure. Okay, can you see my screen? Yes. Yes, just make it full screen, wonderful. Yes, okay. Uh, so my, uh, my presentation is about integrating skills. It's, it's like uh, Mr. Uh, one of Mr. Mr. Yusuf. Is it important to integrate skills in FO classes? That is the question. Okay, uh, my outline is uh, going to be like that. What do we mean by integrating skills? Why it is important to integrate skills in FO classes? How to integrate, to integrate uh, the skills and the advantages of integrating skills approach? What challenges may teacher face? And uh, conclusion. Okay, so what do we mean by integrating skills? What is it about? Integrating skills focuses on the four main English skills, reading, writing, speaking, and listening through a communicative language teaching methodology. And also new grammar patterns are learned in the context of conversation or real life situation. The ultimate goal of this communicative language teaching approach is to focus on, uh, on a real uh, life communication, which means that we are going to present the full skills in a, a real life situation, okay? Mm, hold on. Okay, so why it is important to integrate skills in FL or SL classes? Uh, first of all, skills cannot be isolated. We can we can't isolate the four skills. So when we uh, communicate, we, uh, we often use more than a single language skill. For example, on a telephone conversation, we speak, we listen, and we also write down a message and read over what we have written, right? Okay, so as a, a teacher, we may work on a number of these skills within a single lesson. However, we often teach these skills to uh, students in isolation. But if we want our learners to become successful communicators, we need to make the situations as authentic as possible inside the classroom. Okay. Why is it important to integrate the skills in FO classes? Uh, first, integrating the skills allows teachers to build in uh, more variety into the lesson because of the wider range of activities. Here we are talking about variety of activities. So to, to, to make our classroom more fun, more motivated, okay? Integrating the skills means uh, that the teacher is working uh, at the level of realistic communication, as we said before, which provides all-around development of communicative competence in English. 
Integrated approach helps to build new knowledge and skills on what students already know, sorry, already know and can do. It also allows the teacher to cater for different learning styles and create an engaging and motivating environment for uh, students. And this is very important. The teacher should uh, cater for different learning styles. He should take into account uh, the different learning styles. So he should uh, uh, opt for variety of materials, okay? So now, how can we integrate the skills? To integrate the skills, we have two ways, simple integration and complex integration. Within uh, 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 simple integration is about uh, uh, integrating the skills within the same medium, either oral or written, uh, or written medium, okay? So we can use the receptive uh, skills to serve the productive skills, all right? For uh, complex integration, it involves constructing a series of activities that use uh, a variety of skills. However, it is very important to make sure that one activity is linked thematically to the, ne to the next one. Let's move to the next slide. Okay, this picture, it is about simple uh, integration. We have here the, 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 the two mediums. We can move uh, either from listening to speaking or reading to writing. For example, uh, when, when, we, when we ask our students to read an email and ask them also to write an email uh, starting from the, 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 the email presented, okay? Now, advantages of integrating skills approach. The integrated skills approach exposes English language learners to authentic language and challenges them to interact naturally in the language. This approach stresses that English is not just an object of academic interest, nor merely a key to passing an examination. Uh, here we have to keep in mind that we are uh, uh, we are uh, uh, teaching our students to uh, face uh, situations in life, not teaching them to pass, for example, an exam or uh, like that. Instead, uh, English becomes a real means of interaction and sharing among people. This approach allows teachers to track students' progress in multiple skills at the same time. Learners rapidly gain a true picture of the richness and complexity of the English language as employed for communication. And this is also very important because, uh, we, as, as I said before, when we are communicating, we are using, uh, for example, two or three or four language skills. So it, it, they cannot be isolated and the learner should, should know that. So what challenges my teachers face? Integrating the four language skills can be demanding of the teacher flexibly. And here the teacher should adapt. He can delete, he can replace or supplement anything what he wants to uh, suit his uh, students level and their learning style. It can be a time consuming and it requires a lot of preparation. Another problem is of uh, the problem of designing suitable materials that take account of students different skill level. Uh, teachers have to be skillful in selecting or designing integrated activities to meet their, uh, their students different learning style. And here uh, uh, we have to say that uh, lesson planning is very important. As uh, they said, if you fail to plan, you are planning to fail. Okay, so we come to conclusion. Integrating the four language skills enhance the, the focus on realistic communication, which is essential in developing students' competence in English. Two ways of integrating uh, skills, we, we should keep them in mind, simple integration whereby it's a receptive language skill serves as a model for a productive language skill and complex integration, which is a combination of activities involving different skills linked thematically. 
Integrating language skill learning can be more motivating because the students are using the language for a real purpose. As I said before, we prepare our students for life. We don't prepare them for exams. Okay, and uh, let me stop sharing. I want to share uh, a lesson plan concerning integrating skills, if you don't mind. Yeah, of course you can. Yeah. Sorry. I don't know what's wrong with it. Please wait a minute. Just take your time. It's talking, no problem. <laughs> okay. You still have 10 minutes. Take your time. Okay, thank you. Mm. Yeah. Okay, can you see my screen now? Yes, yes, it's clear now. Okay, now I will start from the bottom. Okay, this is a text, uh, an example of a reading text. And uh, we can uh, start from a text like this and uh, integrate different activities uh, to uh, for the students to uh, use the four scales. Okay. But here I tried to use here uh, to talk about uh, past tense as a, a review of, of course, regular and irregular verb, and also I tried to talk about expressing opinions as a review also. And here I used a video. Remember, always variety is the key. Here in the warm up, I started by recalling some expressions of expressing and responding to opinion, the chart uh, below. In pre reading stage, I prompt students to recognize some celebrities picture. Then I link students answer with the text uh, using some questions. Okay, then here the stage of pre teaching vocabulary, some uh, have vocabulary. In while reading we started by reading the text and aligning the verbs and uh, uh, reviewing the, the grammar point. And here, uh, oh, sorry. And here I used a video about Angelina Jolie, of course, the the, uh, the movie. And I, I used some questions to uh, activate students. In post reading, I asked them to write about their favorite celebrity and why do they like him or her? And here, as uh, for uh, speaking, students will share their production with their class classmates. And that's it. Okay, thank you. Thank Maria you, everyone. For... Thank you, Maria. I hope, for I hope it, was, it was clear. 
Yes, it was crystal clear, actually. It was informative and insightful and amazing. And I'm so sure that our Thank audience... So our much. Yes, I'm so sure that they learned a lot, as I did myself. I learned from your presentation so many ideas so that much. I'm going for sure use them in my classes, especially the last lesson plan you shared and how you gave us like a, an example of how we can use this integration of skills. Uh, okay, I have classes, to mention one thing. Which is Excuse wonderful. me. I have to mention one yeah. thing. That, yeah, sure. that lesson plan was a, a group work. Miriam was in that group. Uh, hi, Miriam, from here. And this is not only my work, it's a group work. Thank okay, you. good. Good. Thank you for uh, mentioning that. And uh, we are grateful for the work of the group. And uh, that's another topic in teaching, uh, which is collaborative yeah. and cooperative teaching. How can you use collaborative teaching in your classes, starting from yourself as a teacher, being collaborative and cooperative with other uh, fellow teachers? So uh, before moving to another topic, which is testing, uh, okay. Uh, <laughs> just having a, a message. Yes, we are going to ask you some questions. And I have a question from the comments. And um, someone talking about learner autonomy and learner training. And my question to both of you, uh, Mr. Hussein, you wanted to say something? Yeah, I, uh, yeah, uh, I, Go mean, ahead. I, just, I, I just would like to congratulate you. Yusuf Aspar and Miriam Shamu for the great presentations they have just shared with our international audience. And it's very amazing, by the way, to see our um, certified teachers. They have just completed 120 hour um, course and they talked about a topic that is not easy because uh, what is easy is to talk about speaking, about reading, about writing, okay. But to talk about integrating skills as a topic, it's a, it's a challenging task. But I can say that they really managed to deliver I mean, the two presentations professionally. And I also learned from the two presentations how integrating skills um, is very important in our EP classes, but at the same time, it's very important once you showed there are some, some drawbacks, there are some challenges behind using or behind integrating the four skills. Yes, again, congratulations, very amazing presentations, and we are very proud of you. We are very proud of our certified teachers. We are very proud of our speakers. We are very proud of our GBF production. And uh, before moving, as I said, to our next speaker, let's first have some questions and a five minute discussion. Of course, I'm going to give you the, the question and you can decide which one to, uh, to answer first. Is Mr. Yusuf or uh, Ms. Uh, Mariam? So our first comment and our first question was about learner autonomy and this brings me brings me to talk about skill integration or the four skills integration and learner autonomy how can we make sure that our students are autonomous learners uh, when we are integrating the four skills in our lesson First, you can explain because the person who has written the, who asked the question, he said, can you please explain to me first learner autonomy? Can one of you uh, take the floor and try to explain what do we mean by learner autonomy and how can we achieve this learner autonomy in our classes? Yes, Yusuf? Can you hear me? Uh, yeah, I hear you. Okay. okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. So concerning the learning autonomy. So uh, uh, as we talk about integrating the skills, the, the four skills. So uh, when we teach the four skills in, during the lesson, we, we, we make sure that students uh, use the language, use, uh, use reading, uh, can read and effectively and can 
can uh, write when they read uh, extensively or intensively, they got more, much information and will be able to write effectively. So uh, when they listen, uh, also when they listen uh, to uh, type recording, for example, they will be able to, to have a good hearing, uh, to have uh, enough inputs and uh, will be able to, uh, to, to produce the language uh, in the next stage. So we, we need to create uh, an environment where students can interact, uh, explore the, the language, can discuss or can negotiate the meaning. So they, they are not just uh, receiving information, they have to receive information, they have to use the language uh, in the class and outside the class. They have to be autonomous learners. They need to, uh, to be an active learners, not a passive learners. Okay, I hope that yes. I'm answering the question. Yes, uh, the explanation, oh, no. yes. The oh, question was yeah. well explained by Mr. Okay. Youssef, but Mariam, okay, if you have something to add to the question, you are, you, you, you go ahead. Okay, first uh, 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 about autonomy, uh, learning or learner autonomy is uh, when we ask, when uh, the learner uh, take control uh, and responsibility of his uh, own learning. Okay, he will be uh, or he should be uh, responsible for his own learning. Uh, in relationship with uh, integrating skills, it is really important because the the student should uh, be responsible that. Uh, using the language, we can we cannot use the four skills in isolation. So uh, they should try to use them and practice using them uh, integrated. Like uh, when they listen, they will uh, they they should have they should uh, be able to produce. And when they read, they should be able to write. Okay, that's my explanation. Yeah, very interesting. Yeah, great. Can I Islam add something? Yes, of course. Thank you. Yes, as far Yusuf and Maryam Shamu, your yeah, wonderful uh, explanations about uh, learning autonomy, where I, we can talk about autonomous learning. Yeah, we as teachers, I mean, as educators, as experienced teachers, we should do our best to switch from having or producing dependent learners to autonomous learners. We are not spoon feeders. We don't provide everything to students, but we have to encourage them to learn by themselves. And as Yusuf and Miriam said, they are in charge, they are in control, and there is a responsibility of their own learning. How? The good teacher provides students with the techniques and skills, strategies to know how to be independent. For example, if they want to learn new vocab, they should not get it from the teacher, but the teacher should provide them with some techniques like diagrams, charts, etc. And based on these techniques, they can learn by themselves. And it's very interesting question because what we have observed when we were uh, at the high school, I mean, the, uh, we um, noticed that the teacher was everything in the classroom. The teacher has the authority. The teacher was the center. So everything I want to get, I should ask the teacher. Today, there is a switch. And here we talk about communicative language teaching. So the learning or the center of the learning process is the learning. So the learner is the center of the learning process. How? By encouraging them and providing them with skills, techniques, strategies to be autonomous learners. Uh, sorry for interrupting you, Mr. Lahoussin. Uh, I want just to, to add something uh, about what you say. So when we talk about integrating skills, uh, we talk about the communicative language teaching. So uh, in the communicative language teaching, uh, the goal is to set communication as a process which enables students to communicate fluently and uh, engage them to negotiate the meaning. So the teacher is, uh, is uh, playing the role of a facilitator. Uh, he facilitates learning. 
So the, uh, the role of the students is to interact, is to interact with the teacher to build the, the lesson. So they are a part of the lesson and not just, not just the teacher. So we have the teacher-students interaction. And thank you so much. Great. So. Yes, I'm, I'm, very, I'm very sure that it's a challenge for the teacher uh, to make his students or to help his students reach this independency, be an independent learner or autonomous learner it's really a challenge in the 21st century because as Mr. Hussein said, in our traditional uh, teaching, we used to be, uh, the teacher used to be the Bible, the know-it-all. He used to uh, transfer knowledge to his students to tell them what to do, what not to do, how they can learn, how they can not learn, uh, uh, the rules, give them the rules, like everything. But nowadays, there is a shift in the educational literature from being the sage on the stage to being a facilitator, as Mr. Uh, Youssef said. A teacher is more here a facilitator, is a more of a helper, a guide. He is a guide to his students and students uh, are becoming more and more aware of the fact that they need to learn skills not knowledge because knowledge is available everywhere wherever you go at the tip of your finger you find everything you find if you want to learn more about speaking about reading about uh, writing but how to choose the best and the appropriate lessons and knowledge that suit every single student and his uh, or her own listen um, uh, learning style and learning strategies that's the challenge and that's what teachers need to do is empower and uh, uh, give help guide students acquire these skills like problem solving critical thinking but becoming independent in learning how to learn because nowadays one of the most courses offered by harvard university and it was taken by over uh, millions millions of people it was called learn how to learn and this course is important why it's important because people uh, when they know how to learn things, when they become independent in learning things, it becomes easier for them to get any knowledge, uh, be it engineering, uh, medicine, medical studies, or anything in the world. Okay, uh, that was my add to the question. And thank you for the, um, I don't remember the name of the person who uh, asked the question, but thank you for asking this interesting, uh, meticulous question. I have another question to our speakers, which is, um, we know that integration of skills is part of communicative language teaching. And we also know there are two approaches in which or which we can use to implement the, to implement this integration of skills. There is task-based learning and also content-based learning. So my question is how can we use both uh, ways or both approaches to integrate uh, skills in our lessons? How can we implement integration of skills in, you can choose, either content-based approach or a task-based approach. Okay. Uh, okay, as you said, uh, Ms. Islam, uh, there is two, uh, two ways of integrating the four skills. As you said, the content-based and the task-based. So in the uh, content-based, uh, it's much related to uh, the communicative language teaching. So uh, <clears throat> uh, students uh, deal with uh, uh, they they, have, they deal with the, the language uh, with the speaking language. They concern with uh, uh, achieving the fluency uh, fluency uh, and not dealing with the grammar or the structure. Uh, the accuracy. So in the task-based learning, the, uh, it is more focused on 
uh, for the tasks, uh, how the students uh, go through the tasks, how they can uh, manage to or succeed to uh, to learn uh, the four skill, to learn the skills uh, in an effective way, how ca they could manage to uh, to cooperate between the reading and the writing, how to how they manage to uh, to write effectively, for example, when they read and how they manage to speak uh, uh, fluently. I hope uh, I hope it's uh, I covered some of. Uh, yeah. Right. Okay. So, um, I think you've answered one part of the question, mm -hmm. but I think it's still blurry. Uh, probably Mariam Shamushi has something to say about this question. Yeah. Mariam? She more or less mentioned something about task-based learning in her uh, lesson plan when she was explaining and when she gave us the example of the lesson plan. She more yeah. or less mentioned task-based learning. Right. Is Mariam Shamu, can you hear us? Yes, yeah, she cannot. Yes, Ms. Islam, I guess we are somehow behind schedule. This question, we can, we can add it in the discussion. It's a very interesting question. We can... I mean, chocolate in the end, okay? Because, yeah, I guess we are still behind schedule. Thank you. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. So uh, we will discuss this question at the end. Wonderful, yeah. Okay, great. Uh, all right, now we move to our next speaker and our next area of the teaching English as a foreign language or the EFL education uh, literature, which is testing and assessment. And... Um, uh, Ms. Mohadis Movahedi, sorry if I'm pronouncing your name incorrectly. She she's a she she comes all the way from Iran. Mm -hmm. She's online with us today. She's going to talk about um, assessment and testing. And the floor is yours, Mohadis, and you have 20 minutes. Hello, everyone. I hope you're all fine and great and doing well. Um, first of all, it's a privilege to be here with you all. And thank you, Mr. Lassaros, for giving us this chance. Uh, my name is Mohad Dessamo Uh I'm from Iran. I've been teaching for about five years. And uh, I've studied English translation here in Iran. I've translated a book from Kafka. And... I guess that's enough. I've run some workshop classes and reading classes here in Iran. And that's it. Um, I hope you can hear me well. Dear Zahra, is that okay? Um, I cannot see the chat box. Just a second. All right. Um, so uh, today we are going to talk about assessment and uh, we are going to check whether uh, it is important in teaching or not. Uh, the first thing we are going to check are the objectives that we are going to check during the presentation, uh, why testing NRT versus CRT test functions, summative test versus formative test, speed test, and power test reliability, authenticity, validity, and productivity, practicality, and so on. The first question, uh, why uh, and what, okay? What is the first thing that comes to mind when you hear the word test? Um, to be honest, uh, I've asked this question for my students and I didn't receive some pleasant ideas or opinions um, there are so many problems at schools, even uh, the attitudes towards uh, testing, assessing students, and uh, 
sometimes teachers try to use their power in order to control the students, their power over the testing part. And uh, what are your perceptions of testing? Normally, when we hear about testing, it is not something pleasant. Uh, the anticipation of a test is normally accompanied by feelings of um, kind of anxiety, um, stress, self-doubt, and sometimes students, they hope that they will kind of come out of uh, that test alive or successful. Um, why testing? Why do we test our students? And what are the importance of testing? Uh, normally, every year, uh, so many uh, people try to kind of uh, train some adept instructors in order to have a perfect and well-designed test. Um, the importance of testing are up to A, uh, A, B, C, up to E. We are going to create a positive attitude uh, by testing students and showing that through testing, they can improve their skills and kind of they can rectify the problems. We are going to motivate students, foster learning and enhancing students' awareness of the objectivity. And uh, the last but the most important one, we are going to make some decisions based on our assessment. Uh, should the students be aware of various interpretations of scores, which is NRT and CRT? Um, when we are going to interpret scores, we have norm reference tests and criterion reference tests. Uh, what is norm reference test? Measuring general language abilities or proficiencies. Uh, we are in norm reference tests we are not going to measure students' uh, specific uh, talent, skill. We are going to measure something generally. In norm reference tests, we are going to use some unfamiliar content, something we haven't used in our classrooms, something that is new. And we are going to eliminate odd one. Uh, by eliminating odd one, I mean that uh, sometimes one score is uh, really out of the race. Um, the range of the scores. For example, most of the students, they get A, B, C, and one student, maybe D, F, we are going to omit that score because that's not important. Or sometimes one item is missed by most of the students, maybe 90, 80% of the students, we are going to omit that item because the purpose of the testing, it is not to check whether they have missed that item or not. You are going to grade students on the curve, which means in norm reference test, we are going to compare students to each other. For example, I'm going to compare student A's score with student B's score, whether that person is number one or that person is number two. And uh, this rating is really important. And uh, we are going to make in, uh, we are going to make program level decisions. For example, at the schools, when we um, take a test for I mean for teachers, um, we are going to check whether our the teachers are qualified or not. But sometimes when we give the test to students, we are going to check whether they are qualified and they can pass that test or not. By making program level decisions, we are going to check whether that student has passed that level or not. That person is uh, appropriate to be level, uh, in, in level intermediate, level upper intermediate, or should be um, kind of in level elementary. Criterion reference tests are those tests uh, which are going to be kind of measured by teachers and are really important, your uh, criterion reference tests measure are going to measure specific objectives. For example, uh, here we are going to measure either grammar, uh, fluency, accuracy, sometimes the reading speed, and you are going to use some familiar content for these tests. Uh, after the test, if well, most of the students have missed one item. 
it is really important and we need to revise or add some further instructional materials. We need to check why most of the students have missed that item. And sometimes we need to go back, check the curriculum and ch check some problem why most of the students didn't get that question, whether the problem was with the question or not, or sometimes the rubric of the question and the validity, validity and reliability of the test completely. And here in criterion reference test, we are going to compare student scores with a predetermined criterion or standard. Here, we are not going to compare students together. We are going to compare students level with a standard which we have had uh, before kind of giving the test to students. Um, there are various test functions, uh, attainment evaluation and prognostic test. Um, sorry if I speak too fast because there are so many slides. Uh, proficiency achievement and knowledge test. Achievement tests are divided into three parts and aptitude placement and selection. Proficiency tests are just like TOEFL or IELTS test. Um, we have no idea what the content will be. And we do not know whether the test will be kind of about geography, that is somehow psychological or not. And they are going to measure something generally. Achievement tests, which are normally used at the schools or language schools, um, are really important. We have general progress and diagnostic tests. Diagnostic tests are used in order to find students' strengths and weaknesses in a course. Progress tests uh, at the end of a specific uh, unit or portion of a course, we are going to have some progress tests in order to check whether students have mastered that part or not. General achievement tests are normally in the middle of the test, in the middle of the course, and students are going to answer uh, some short questions, sometimes matching questions, uh, in order just to understand whether they have understood that or not. Prognostic tests, we have aptitude. Aptitude tests are used and kind of designed to predict uh, applicants or students' success in achieving certain objectives in the future. For example, in aptitude tests, we are not going to uh, measure students' ability only and only in one skill or one talent of that, that student. We are going to check that student's abilities generally. Uh, normally, they are designed to measure students or sometimes people's ability and capability of general ability in order to check whether they will be successful in a given task or not. Placement tests, um, they are used to determine the most appropriate channel of education for examining. For example, uh, normally at schools or language schools, before we put the students in the right level, we need to have some placement tests in order to check that student's proficiency, fluency, and accuracy. Uh, the purpose of the placement test is merely to measure cap uh, the capability or uh, the ability of the students uh, in a specific part. We are going to check that the student's um, general knowledge uh, of the given subject, which we are going to place that student. Selection tests, uh, they are normally uh, given kind of at um, entrance exams of university. Uh, normally, we are going to have some questions which are either really hard or uh, the difficulty of the questions will be increased uh, once after some questions in order to omit some students and put the students in the rank order of the best to the least uh, well students. There is no pass or fail in selection tests. 
um, and we are going to check whether uh, they can fulfill some specific questions that we have and it is not specifically for schools and they can be used even at companies when they want to hire some people they can have some selection tests in order to kind of truncate some uh, participants from that uh, company's uh, forms and um, hiring uh, those uh, people they can use this selection test We've got formative and summative tests. Summative tests are uh, formal tests. They are assessed and they are assessment of learning. They are normally at the end of the course or unit of the instruction. Uh, we are going to certify students masteries of a specific part or specific objective in our course. And it is dealt with the productive or the production of learning the productive part of the course. Formative tests are informal and they are assessment for learning. You are using them in order to teach our students how to learn something. And they are normally at the end of a small segment of the materials. They are self-graded or no grade is even given to the student. Um, they, we can have the test. We can explain why we are using these tests to the students and they can check whether they have understood the part or the task or not, then they can, uh, we can give the answer to the students and ask them to check their own grades instead of uh, we collect the papers and check them by ourselves. And it is dealt with the process of learning at the end of the portion of the material. We have got power tests and speed tests, um, there are different functions and objectives behind these tests. If you are going to use power tests, so each question should be kind of more difficult than the previous one, increasing item difficulty generally. For example, question one, that student is just gonna deal with uh, maybe present simple, but in question 10 or 15, present perfect and little by little that is students will stop answering those tests and those questions. And you're going to check how much a candidate is able to answer the questions, how far they can go. And in power tests, we are going to give students enough time or ample time that the test should be under no uh, stress or problems for the student. A good environment should be uh, prepared for the student. But speed tests, on the other hand, are the tests that they hold the level of the test at the same level with the previous questions or each question. We are going to limit the given time. Uh, for example, for 100 questions, we are going to give uh, 30 or 40 minutes. Uh, we want students just to answer them so fast and you are going to check whether they can focus on the questions or not. You are going to check how fast the student is able to answer the questions. Reliability, validity, and authenticity. Um, I think they are the most important part in each test. Reliability, consistency of one score with respect to one's average score over repeated administration. It means a test should be able to repeat its mark or its score after a few days, uh, normally in two week uh, delay for the next test. And they should be able to repeat the score of that test again. We do not mean that uh, if a student gets um, 80, next time that student should get 80 again, exactly. Uh, it means maybe by some uh, error, um, if we add some error part uh, from that student's uh, level, then we can reach the reliability of that test. Validity, to the extent to which the test measures what it is supposed to measure. For example, if you are going to measure grammar, the test should be only uh, about 
grammar. Uh, we cannot give reading parts or kind of matching parts to students and ask them uh, to do a listening task, which is not appropriate. And about the authenticity of the test, a test should represent something about the natural life or real life. That should be really meaningful to them. Uh, if we are going to teach students how to make an email, we need to kind of give the paper of the first slide of the email and ask them to complete it, to fill in the blanks and ask them for the production part to go home and make an email, then send you an email about anything they want, even say hi. Uh, this is authenticity, the degree of correspondence of characteristics of a given test uh, to features of target language use tasks. What factors would influence reliability? Uh, um, these factors are really important because if it meets one, then the test uh, the test reliability either would be overestimated or underestimated. The effect of testees, for example, sometimes our students and even sometimes we teachers, when you are having a test, uh, you know, we human beings are dynamic creatures. The performances of us uh, will fluctuate in different situations and from time to time we will change. So uh, either there will be some psychological problems sometimes or sometimes some physiological problems or conditions. For example, my student uh, had a terrible headache, so she or he cannot um, give the test and take the test exactly in the correct way as I even expected. Um, sometimes students, uh, maybe they had some family issues or some issues with their feelings so they cannot take the test as well as they should. The effect of test factors. Um, when we are talking about the effect of test factors, we, we are talking about the homogeneity of uh, items and the things that are in the test. For example, when you are talking about the homogeneity of the item, it means all the tests, during the test, you should only and only measure one skill during the test, but while teaching, that should be integrated as uh, my friend said, but while testing and assessing our students level of uh, fluency, accuracy in grammar, speaking or different parts, we need to measure only and only one part. And there shouldn't be some other uh, extra options for students and the more homogeneous the test items, the more consistent scores it will produce. And we have got speed tests, we have got this ambiguity of instructions. It means the rubric and the way the students are reading the questions should be clear and they should know how to answer the questions, whether they have to match them, whether they have to tick the questions. And the length of the questions should not be that much long. So the students would, be, would not be distracted from the test. And the influence of scoring factors, we have intra-rater reliability and inter-rater reliability. When you are talking about intra-rater reliability, it means that um, sometimes one person who is going to check the papers of the students cannot score a paper the same twice. For example, first, when that person is going to check that paper, maybe he or she can see the name of that student. So they know that that student is a perfect student, so they are going to add some extra mark, or sometimes they are going to ignore some uh, kind of uh, tribal mistakes. Or sometimes, because that student is a troublemaker student. In that I'm sorry class, to interrupt you. Yes, Mohadis, sorry to mm -hmm. interrupt you. You still have five minutes. Thank you so much. Uh, so, because that student is a troublemaker, that teacher or that person who's going to check the paper is going to omit or kind of eliminate those parts of the test, even uh, they are correct and kind of they are so tough with the checking the paper. And the effect of response factors, um, we've got guessing part, some students, they try to guess some answers. So that 
part would kind of overestimate or underestimate the reliability of that uh, test, uh, which means that sometimes they answer randomly. So their, their score would be so high. Sometimes they are unlucky, unlike kids. So the score would be so low. And we have got uh, the next slide. We have got various types of uh, validity content base validity, validity and construct validity. Content validity, it means we are going to measure what we have to measure. We are not going to omit or add some parts to the test. The, um, there should be a correspondence between the test content and the content of the materials we have taught in our classrooms. About base validity, um, it means that when you look at the test, that should look a valid test. For example, if you are going to measure speaking, a test should not be something like about reading or matching. There should be some questions. The students are going to talk about those questions. And construct validity, we are going to check uh, and add some specific characteristics in accordance with the theory of language, behavior, of, uh, behavior and learning of the student. It means uh, we have to uh, check whether those students are going to be in a pressure uh, environment or not. And we are going to add whether some uh, noises or parts should be added or eliminated from those tests. There are some factors which would uh, influence validity, direction, difficulty level of the test, sample truncation. Sample truncation, it means that we omit uh, lots of parts from the test or from the course. Uh, or sometimes from the coursework in order to make the test more simple or more difficult. The structure of items, they should be clear enough that students would know uh, what to do with the test and the arrangement of the items and the correct responses should be, the correct responses should be randomly and the arrangement of the items. We should start the test with a simple question, number one, then we are going to add some difficulty to those questions. Practicality, uh, when you are talking about practicality, we need to know that whether those tests, we want to put them uh, in the classrooms, uh, whether they are possible or not to be established or administrate. Uh, we've got ease of test administration, scoring application and interpretation. Washback or backwash, this is the influence of testing on teaching, the facet of consequential validity. Uh, we, there are some other names for uh, washback. We've got backwash, measurement driven instruction, curriculum alignment. Uh, there are some positive washback and some negative washback. Sometimes teachers, they, you know, they know that the test will be about reading, so they try to work more on reading part. This is something positive and okay. But uh, sometimes teachers know that okay, at the end of the term, there should be some, uh, there will be some um, vocabulary. Uh, so they only and only focus on vocabulary part and not listening, reading, speaking, or other skills. This is something negative. And thank you so much. If there is any questions, I'd be glad to explain. Thank you, Mohadis, for this uh, fruitful, informative presentation. Uh, of course, there are some questions from the chat. I have someone who, uh, Mona Qurbani, who has two questions. Mm -hmm. Okay, the first question, okay. and uh, the first question is, she's talking about um, construct, like tests which are designed for companies to hire people. She said, okay. what about these tests? Um, how can you know if they are valid or not? And is the validity of this test is fixed or permanent? Um, about the validity of tests, uh, we cannot be sure whether when we are designing a test, uh, our test is only valid in one part and one aspect of that. For example, if you are going to use uh, the grammar part in the other parts, so it's not a valid test. We cannot add some other listening parts to the grammar in order to have more questions or make it more valid. It's not something correct. Uh, tests, 
are valid only and only in the part that they are going to measure. And as the definition of validity, they should and they are supposed to measure what they are going to measure. And about the companies, uh, because I said uh, selection test, uh, there's no pass or fail. Uh, normally, after selection test, we do have a, um, what do we call kind of like competition test. We are going to omit some uh, participants from the test in order to just hire or have 10 people from that test. I hope okay. it is clear enough. If not, I yes, it's explain more. Yes, yes, it's clear enough. It's really clear. I think I have another argument based validity. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. I thought there is a question in the chat, but it's not a question. Uh, actually, I have questions of my own, but I'm going to leave them until the end so that we can have a whole group discussion. I thank you very much, Muhadis, for this wonderful presentation. And ladies and gentlemen, people who are following us on Facebook or on YouTube, this is a good example of, uh, of course, beside um, Yosef and Mariam before, these are good examples of our TEFL trainees and how fluent they are, not only in English, but how fluent they are in English pedagogy and how they can discuss uh, 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 freely uh, assessment, testing, integration of skills. These are very important and very challenging topics in the ALT to talk about. Thank you, Mohadis. And now let's yeah, move to great. another. Yes, uh, can you, I say so something, much. Islam? Yes, Thank Mohadis, you. would you please stop sharing your screen so that you can give the chance to uh, other? Thank you. Yes, Mr. Hussein, go ahead. Yeah, I would uh, I would like just to remind the audience that Muhadis is one of the loyal customers of Global Bus Foundation. She's a very active learner and a great teacher. She attends all the webinars organized by Global Bus Foundation and uh, webinars organized by other companies. And I'm sure that what, she, I mean, Muhalis, what she has learned during this course, 120 hour intensive course in summer, and now this is the result. Uh, I can say also that it's not easy to, um, to talk or to discuss um, topics related to testing or assessment. It's very complicated topics, but the way she tackled this presentation or this topic was again, very professional and we are proud of you. Muhadis, Iran is proud of you. Iran is lucky to have a great teacher like you. Thank you so much, my honor. And really that is a privilege to be part of this presentation and seminar. Thank you so much. Our pleasure. Yes, as Mr. Al Hussein said, Iran is, is very proud and is very lucky to have you, Muharis, as a teacher of English. And of course, Moroccan audience and Morocco is also happy and proud to have you as a, a lecturer, as a speaker, as a, as a GBF a TEFL trainee and uh, as an alumna of the TEFL course. Uh, now we move to our next speaker. She's Fatima Zahra Al Wardi, um, a great, uh, another great speaker who is going to talk to us more about public speaking and debates. For all those of you who are interested in incorporating and implementing debates and public speaking in their classes, and they don't know till now how they can do this because it's really challenging. Another challenging thing you can do in your classes is to incorporate both things, debates and uh, public speaking. But Fatima Zahra Wardi, she's going to make it accessible and possible to all of us. The floor is yours, Fatima Zahra, go ahead. Thank you for, uh, for giving the floor. So my topic is a little bit uh, like, in, like my uh, classmate uh, Youssef and Muhadis. We integrate skills in public speaking and debate. When you are speaking, you are integrating speaking and listening, which are very important in ESL's classroom and a part of assessing our students. So before I screen share, I'm gonna start by telling a story. My story started when I had an internship 
in the school. And we had a learned discussion with, with the, my fellow teachers. And I said to, uh, to a teacher, uh, why don't you use public speaking uh, and debate in your classroom? He said, well, how can I uh, expect an output from my student while they, are, they didn't have an input? And I said, you can't do it. When you are teaching, you are giving them a lot of input. So, uh, and why are giving them a topic or any, uh, either in public speaking or either for debating, you don't have time to uh, have a, um, to, uh, to, to do some research, to do whatever. And as our, t our teacher, Hussein, always say pre-teach. And what you are, why you are teaching uh, grammar, why you are teaching uh, uh, reading, you are also pre-teaching vocabulary that they can use in public speaking. So my topic for today is about public speaking and how you can use that. So let me screen share. Um, First of all, um, we should speak about the first, the very first one, which is round table discussion. Round table discussion can be uh, seen like a very easy one, and but nobody think of using it. And the thing, the very great thing about using round table is that it's low the stress of the student and and give them like um, 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 they are like uh, at ease and some sometimes they think that they don't have something to say but by the time they found a lot of things to say uh, during uh, during discussion and it can and it can be on the beginning of the class and as well at the, the, at the very end of the class. My, my area is public speaking. The great thing in public speaking is make your student to stand, to stand up in front of the class. Um, for the, the, round, the round table, they can just sit in their, in their place. But this one, during public speaking, they go from their uh, comfort zone and start to speak by them, themselves. And the greatest thing in public speaking, uh, you can give them time to either prepare it at, at uh, home or during the class. And it can be um, through games. For example, uh, here I have a one minute speech. For example, I have here a game like uh, speak for one minute. Um, I'm gonna ask from for uh, my friend uh, Islam. Can can you uh, open your mic, Islam? Yes. Uh, yes. So we are going to play a, a very uh, traditional game in public speaking. Okay? Yes, it's a great game. Yes. Do you want uh, us you, to play uh, with you? Yeah, I want you to play with me. Okay. Me. Oh yes. Okay. I've used this game before in my class last year. It's it's a wonderful one. Okay. Yeah. Can you uh, pick one uh, one letter? Okay, I'm Islam, so I'm gonna choose I. Ah, okay. So uh, here, can you speak about your best friend for one minute? Of course. Okay, my best friend. Shall I start? Yeah. Okay, my best friend's okay. name is. Okay. Shall I start? Yeah, yeah, start. One, two, my best three. My, my best yes. friend's name is Wafa Zindin. She is a very good person and she, she, she has a warming heart. I love her so much. We have met seven years ago. We have been friends for seven years now. And uh, why I love her so much, because she's, she's supportive, she's uh, wonderful, she's uh, beautiful, and she always, always, always uh, make me happy. 
Um, my friend Wafa is now a teacher of English and she's also a master student. She's now studying for culture and linguistics, majoring in linguistics, uh, her master's. And she has a beautiful girl named Mariam. She's her daughter. And she calls me um, uh, Saloma, like uh, my uh, my friend's uh, uh, friend, my friend's daughter and she's a cute little baby who is now about five uh, four four months old and that's it <laughs> good job good yay job, good job. <laughs> yay so the the game uh, this game can be easy like sometimes so so easy for uh intermediate students who are uh, speaking, uh, who knows a lot of vocabulary, but can can work also for the be the beginners. Um, I tried for with beginners, but uh, they had to prepare before at home and came back and speak about about a topic. This game is very easy one, but I'm gonna ask now. Um, Mr. Hussein to open his mic. We are going to play another game, which yes. is a part a part of public speaking. Um, which is um, I want you to make for me a commercial for this object. So What's that? yeah, what that object? I can't see very well. <laughs> yeah, it is a USB. Okay. Yes, so for one minute? Um, yeah, for one minute, okay. Okay, so this product is very helpful because it stores a lot of information. It's not very expensive. It's like your best friend. You can take it wherever you are and it's gonna save your life because you can store and you can save all the most important things. Now, if you are studying at the university, you will have to learn a lot of things. Sometimes you cannot remember or you cannot save them. So this yeah. product will help you to save all these things. Yeah, that's it? Yeah, that's, that's it. Wonderful, thank good you. Job. Good job, good job. I can, Thanks. I'm gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna buy it later. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Yeah, so the, the very important thing of uh, public of using public speaking game is is that it's slow the stress it's make them want to to try um even though they are, they are in the beginning they will say that oh i i don't know how to speak but by the time they can they can they can speak they, they're gonna speak but for the, this is a game that you can use as a public speaking but for public speaking we have you can use it in other different way, I, I, uh, apart from this that is ceremonial or demonstrative or informative, which, which is like using this game. You can use it also, for example, uh, during recalling a session. You can bring out the student and recall something or speak about something they learn, and then you are making an expos uh, expository uh, uh, spe speech. Which which they are given ex, uh, they, must, uh, they are demonstrating something in grammar and it's law your chichi your chichi time. Um, next next which is debating, which I master for like three years now. Um, debating it can be a very very much challenging for a teacher to do, apart from pub from public speaking. Why? Because it needs a lot of time and need to think a lot about the su uh, the subject and the the, the subject that you are going to do during the um, the debate. What is debate first? It's like. Um, it's like public speaking, or pub, a debater first is a public speaker. Uh, it's like, uh, you can think, in as, think of it as a match, uh, a football or a ping pong game. I like it like ping pong game because it's like you give, um, 
you give an argument and the other one give an argument and goes back and forth, then someone is winning the game. Um, and why is debate and why is public speaking? It gives the, your student the confidence in, this, in themselves. They, think they start to, uh, to, uh, to speak in front of an audience. They start to speak up for, for themselves when, while they learn debate. They start to have a critical thinking, which we need in our country. We need critical thinkers. We need someone who will do research uh, uh, who, uh, for arguments and counter arguments. Um, we need um, someone who self-learn because why, why are doing a debate are self-learning uh, by reading a lot of materials and writing your case you are integrating another skill which is writing. Um, they are in, in debate, we have two formats. Uh, we have early debate, which is Lincoln Douglas debate and parliamentary debate. These are, uh, these two counts can be uh, a little bit hard for, uh, uh, for um, beginners and first intermediate. It can be for intermediate, go good for intermediate six and back for, and, and go to uh, advanced students because it needs um, a, lot, a lot of efforts and a lot of, uh, of um, a right, uh, re, uh, speaking because uh, advanced students can speak more fluently than intermediate and, and the, um, the beginners, the uh, the games that you can use apart from doing the, your case as a as a form uh, a formal debate are like mm, let me see I forgot we have schizophrenia game we do this schizophrenia game is to teach. Uh, to teach the student to think for an argument for one minute and the uh, other minute to speak uh, uh, the counter argument by themselves. Um, I'm gonna ask again Islam. Islam spoke for one minute um, in the public speaking game about one topic, right? Yes. Yes, I want you. I want to use it again for one for two minutes. Okay, I want you um, to speak. Um, let me think about a topic. Can you speak about divorce? Is divorce easy for you? Divorce. Uh, uh, yeah, I want you for uh, for one minute to agree with divorce and disagree it for the second minute. Can you do that? Yes. Okay. Okay. Let me see if it's easy for you, and then I'm going to ask another one to try it for me. Okay, shall I start? Yes. When I clap, you change. You, uh, mute, you, um, you muted yourself. Yes, can you hear me now? Yes. Shall I start? Yeah, one, two, three. Divorce is uh, one of the best choices that a couple can choose in order to end conflicts, in order to end heartbreaks, in order to end problems, in order to live happily. It doesn't mean that when you opt for, as, as a couple, when you opt for divorce, this doesn't mean that you are going to hate each other forever and you are going to become enemies. But no, divorce as any other uh, part of ending a relationship you are going to become to stay friends if you have kids this is this is gonna be for the good for 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 kids because they are going no longer to see two parents who are living uh, together well divorce again is another uh, difficult issue to deal with in society Kids who are coming from a divorced parents are going to be homeless, are going to be uh, schizophrenic, are going to be psychologically ill and sick. Divorced parents, again, 
may not have the best relationship in the world. They may have conflicts, they may have problems, they may have uh, issues, and this is going to affect negatively the kids more than uh, the parents. Also, it's very bad. Divorce, divorce is very bad for society, for society because uh, divorced parents are not going to be well concentrated on their uh, jobs. Yeah, they are going all the time to think about their partner. They are going. Okay, <laughs> That's it. <thank> <laughs> <you. Okay. laughs> How did you find the the, um, the switch between uh, being uh, in agreement then right right back to disagreement? Was it easy or a bit yeah. hard? It was easy, actually. It was really easy. Amazing. Yeah. It, 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 it's amazing how your mind can switch from agreeing with the topic to disagreeing with the same topic. So and now I'm going to ask argument. Mariam. Now I'm going to ask Mariam, please. Mariam, can you uh, uh, activate your mic? Mariam? She? Yeah. I want you to do the same thing as Islam did, to speak about friendship agree with friendship and disagree with friendship. Okay, I yeah. think that uh, friendship is a very uh, good thing to have. Uh, you have someone to respect and uh, go to when you have a difficult time. Also, you, uh, you can uh, try to be with your friend uh, during difficult times and good times. You can have uh, fun together. Uh, also, mm -hmm. Friendship is actually a noble thing. It's not easy to be uh, just friends with anybody. Also, now against friendship. You still, I need to clap. You still have one minute. You have to, okay. Uh, also, uh, friendship is, I don't know. <laughs> okay, so against friendship. Uh, friendship, it may be a, bit, a little bit difficult to be friends. Sometimes you don't know the intentions of people. Uh, sometimes, I don't know. It's good to be friends and, <laughs> yeah. Was it, we find it a little bit hard, right? I was a bit uh, yeah. caught off guard. <laughs> yeah, yeah. This is the great part of the game. Some, some, um, when teaching debate, we started with the schizophrenia game. Uh, the reason why a lot of, a lot of students find it a little bit hard to switch, they are agreeing with uh, a case, yeah. then, then they want to disagree, then, then they have to disagree. Then we start with the schizophrenia, we call it schizophrenia because it's like our schizophrenic and they, they learn how to switch. Another game is finding uh, an argument for a resolution or a motion. Uh, the game works like this. You give a resolution to a student, your student, a group of your student of uh, three, four, or maybe, uh, maybe less or more. Um, then you give them a resolution and they have to think about three or four arguments that depends on the uh, on the number of the students, and they have to. And the other ones, they have to think of. Uh, they will give them other other uh, resolution. And while uh, while after like after thinking about the arguments, they uh, they start to read their uh, their uh, their arguments. The other ones should shout right back for them the counter argument. This is the game. I don't think if it's a little bit clear or not. I don't know. The other one is cross examination. Um, Just to remind you of Fatima Zahra. Yeah. You still have five minutes. Okay. Uh, the last one is cross examination. It goes with uh, the uh, asking questions. Uh, back and forth, uh, and and, and uh, like it's it teach how to ask questions for for the students. They have to ask question back and forth, back and forth. Uh, the very last one that I want to speak about is MUNs. 
I don't know if anybody here um, know, uh, knows about MUN or not. MUN is Model UN. Yes, uh, Zara, sorry for yes. interrupting you. Just make it yes. full screen. Full screen. Thank you. Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. The Model UN, I don't know if, if you know it, is, it's, it's about uh, uh, acting as if you are uh, in a delegate in the actual uh, United Nations Assembly. We have delegates and we have uh, chairs like uh, parliaments or the, the actual one. The, 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 the greatest part of using Model UN in the class or uh, as an assessment in the class is that uh, you use writing first uh, because you have to write a position paper, you are assessing writing and you are doing public speaking, you are debating and you are, uh, um, what is? Uh, you are finding solution for a problem, a political problem, which is teach the, the students how to be open about, uh, to discuss or to read about politics. Um, and that's it for, um, I'm gonna share with you some uh, model UNs that are in Morocco, that are very common, which are uh, al Akhawain. Uh, Meknes and Weir and Maroc MUN. They are in the three uh, languages, which are Arabic, French, and English. And you can even uh, create uh, one for your classroom. Um, and for debating, we have, um, as a part of the great debaters, we have uh, the we have uh, many uh, clubs in, across the, the nation. Um, we have one in Marrakesh, one in Casablanca, and that America, and and uh, and you can visit the website of the Great Debater Organization, or you can visit for the Moroccan National Debate teams who are uh, also do a Moroccan debate camp, and they do the parliamentary debate. We are doing the uh, ALDI debate. And thank you. If, uh, if you have any question, you can ask me later. Thank you. The floor uh, is yours, is Islam. Yes, thank you, Fatima Zahra, for this wonderful practical workshop. Actually, it was more a workshop than a presentation, and it was 100% practical. I liked it very much, and I'm so sure that the audience, um, as their comments, I'm reading their comments here, and they are very, really enjoying your presentation. Well done, Fatima Zahra. And uh, because of... Okay. <laughs> uh, because of time constraints, we are going to move uh, to the next speaker, and we are going to have a discussion at the end. Our next speaker is Mariam. So we have two Mariams today. Uh, the second Mariam, Mariam Khorshi, she's going to talk about neuroscience and education, a topic which is, again, very crucial in the ALT. The floor is yours, Mariam. Go ahead. Hello. Okay, so hello again. Hello. Today I'll be tackling an emerging topic. I'll try to share the limited knowledge that I've gained from online courses and the research available on the topic of educational neuroscience. So the objectives of this presentation are to briefly define neuroscience, to draw a clear relationship between education and neuroscience, to mention some findings and teachings from neuroscience, some strategies to enhance learning, and finally, how teachers are brain changers. So first of all, what is neuroscience? Just to put you in the picture, the nervous system has the brain, the spinal cord, and the peripheral nerves. Neuroscience is about the study of the brain, what triggers behavior in the brain, why and how. Also, different parts of the brain have different functions. 
for example, there's a part related to memory, another part related to movement, uh, another part related to emotions, etc. In this presentation, you'll be hearing the word the amygdala a lot. We actually have two, one in each side of the brain. This is where ab ability to feel emotions and perceive them. And also this is where we uh, sense fear or form, in, form uh, anxiety. The spinal cord sends signals to do something or to feel something. So you may be wondering, what is this relationship between education and neuroscience? Researchers in the field attempt to use new findings that are emerging from neuroscience about learning and the brain and try to translate it to improve the learning process. So uh, scientists use neuroscience findings that are emerging from neuroscience and try to use these in, this information to the classroom. So the main aim is to improve teaching and learning. So questions such as how children learn, how quickly they can learn, what affects their learning, how stress affects their learning emerge. Also, it has been proven that we tend to remember emotionally charged moments better than boring ones. So based on this idea, it is advised by educational neuroscientists to create a positive learning environment. Now moving into the next slide, we have some findings of neuroscience. Early learning is powerful. The first five years of a child's life is very important for her his or her brain's development. Any neglect activates the amygdala and may lead to post-traumatic effects. Caregivers need to give them attention, respond to them. Being unresponsive is neglect. Also, unpleasant or difficult situations, such as violence, impairs the ability to cope with stress, depression later on, and so on and so forth. These early experiences have a lifelong impact on a person's life. So it's, uh, it affects a person throughout his life. So if someone has experienced these uh, traumatic symptoms, uh, it may continue on until adulthood or even further if uh, the person is not treated. Teachers may notice these days 15 year olds or 16 year olds acting like children. Um, this is more likely a post traumatic effect of a childhood trauma. So uh, teachers often confuse this with ADHD. So they may notice uh, the person is seeking attention. The learner is seeking attention, but in fact, he is just uh, experiencing post-traumatic symptoms. So this is not all, also the always the result of problems experienced in childhood, also many other economic and social constraints, such as poverty, uh, violence, as I've mentioned before. So the teacher can encourage students to write a diary. Here we have some strategies. The best strategy here is to encourage your students to write journals or diaries. Why journals and diaries? Because journals help learners regulate their emotions. If you jot down your past experiences, your present experiences, uh, what you want to do in the, in the future, this helps you to uh, know what you're doing and what you want and what you don't want and helps this learner who's experiencing post-traumatic effects to regulate his or her emotions. This is a very effective way and it has been proven by neuroscientists and educational neuroscience researchers. 
Also, another strategy, of course, the most important one is to try to create a positive learning environment in the classroom. Also, encourage students that uh, they can make mistakes. For example, uh, say that even the teacher can make mistakes. Look here, the word unpleasant is written with E, not an A. Uh, in, we have double N, so everyone makes mistakes. And it is important to create this positive learning experience in the classroom. Sometimes students lack a deep memory of feeling safe and loved. In this case, receptors in the, in the brain that respond to human kindness fail to develop. So teachers may find a student who doesn't appreciate his or her efforts. Teachers should not take it personally, instead put the possibility that they may have experienced continuous disappointment from adults. In other words, the experiences they've previously had with teachers was mostly negative. So they don't have any memory of being loved by a parent. They don't have a memory of being uh, loved by a teacher or respected by a teacher. So the most experiences they've had was negative so when you when a teacher is good to them or is uh, tries his best in the classroom and he finds a student who doesn't respond it's not because he does he doesn't he has never had this before he has never had an adult who had been nice to him or her so uh, the student is in a state of shock and fails to acknowledge his teacher in this case, the teacher needs to be patient and try to create a positive learning environment where students are not afraid of making mistakes. Moving on to the next slide, here we have the brain as a social organ. So the brain is a social organ. In other words, our brains need connection in order to thrive. Being more social is the key to become more successful. Based on this idea, it is crucial that teachers create a positive social experiences in the classroom. So how can teachers do this? By varying the activities uh, based on collaboration and working in groups. This is a great opportunity for students to also practice their social skills. So the teacher can use role play, uh, debates such as what has uh, Zahra emphasized, uh, dialogues, conversations, any sort of activity that makes students work in groups and collaborate and practice their speaking and uh, not just uh, learners who receive information, but they try to socialize and um, improve their social skills. Here also we have sharing stories. Yes, sharing stories is also a great strategy to improve students' social skills. Here we have the mind, brain and body are connected. Here, neuroscience draws on the importance of sleep, the importance of good nutrition, the importance of regular exercise, to, and how they affect learning. How sleep, good nutrition, regular exercise affects learning, how students are affected by these things. Also, we have how certain environmental conditions affect learning, either positively or negatively. Here, what we mean by environmental conditions, uh, for example, external noise, uh, the, the, the state of the classroom, is it clean? Is it, of course, this is uh, uh, economic, this uh, environmental conditions, if we speak about them in the Moroccan context, you see the state of classrooms in, in, that we have in public schools. They're not 
very well equipped. This is not the last thing that we look at, actually, the environmental conditions besides uh, other things. So here we have teachers can change the brain. So how can teachers change the brain? Teachers are neuroplasticians. What we mean by neuroplasticity is uh, the fact that the brain can change. Uh, the brain, this is very good news, the brain doesn't, uh, is influenced throughout life. It's not just stable. The problems that you faced in your childhood can be uh, can be fixed and you can move on with your life and you can succeed eventually. So uh, the brain has the ability to be influenced throughout life. It changes from their daily experiences, uh, thoughts and perception. So it changes throughout life. So through positive experiences in the classroom, Teachers can rewire their students' brains. It would be great if teachers never lose hope on a student because as long as they have the ability to learn, they brain, their brains can be rewired to overcome challenges from the past. Here we have we teach because in a world where there is little hope, teachers can be the only light for a child who has been left in the dark. So we can conclude that teachers have this ability to rewire their students' brain uh, through the positive experiences in the classroom. And thank okay. You. Thank you, Mariam, for this insightful presentation. Very interesting topic. Thank you for opening our eyes. Uh, thank you for opening our eyes to to this neuroscience and how neuroscience can be implemented in education and how teachers, they should know about all what you have mentioned in order to make their journey, their, their teaching journey, a fruitful and a wonderful experience. Okay, now uh, let's have uh, a discussion. Um, of course, if you have any question, I'm going yeah. to read in the chat. Uh, yes. Islam, thank you. I would, uh, I would like uh, again to uh, congratulate Zahra and uh, Miriam for the very interesting topics they have just presented. So Zahra talked about debates and public speaking EP classes. And we as teachers, we know that learners like to, uh, to communicate. They can communicate uh, via debates or public speaking. And it's very important for teachers to know how to provide uh, interesting activities based on debates or public speaking. Neuroscience is a very interesting topic because nowadays teachers have got a lot of challenges, okay? Um, they face and they should know how to make a balance between personal, professional, family life, etc. So the topic Miriam has just talked about is very fruitful, not only for teachers, but for all employees. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, whenever you work and wherever um, you work. Thank you again for our certified trainers. Sorry, teachers, you are gonna be trainers in the future, of course, okay. And I would like again to give the floor to Islam. Yeah, for more, I mean, discussions or if there are any other questions. Yes, Islam, please. Yes, there is a question. Uh in the chat box for uh, for Mariam, the last speaker, Mariam, uh, who talked about neuroscience. Uh, mm -hmm. His question is uh, Bizri Muhammad. He said, I think it's a modest question, but what is the difference between mind and brain? He would love to know more and he would like to know the differences between a mind and the brain. Mariam? Okay, so... Uh, I don't think I'm in the position to answer this question because it is very complicated. As I've said, neuroscience is very broad and just to include it to, in the educational context, I'm not a neuroscientist, but I try to use uh, the findings that are emerging from neuroscience in the educational context. Okay. Uh Actually, there is another question for you, Mariam. You've got so many questions, okay? Mm -hmm. A question from Mona. She's saying, uh, as you have mentioned, 
Uh, sometimes we have some students which have a bad memory of their previous teachers, also called a trauma. They have a trauma of their teachers. So what can we do about this? How can we maybe erase this uh, bad memory and start a new one? Uh, okay, so as I've said, you need to first notice these symptoms. Why is this student acting this way? You can't just go and why are you acting this way? No, you need to, for example, encourage your students to write in diaries and journals. This helps them to regulate their emotions. And also, uh, it depends. There are many, um, many behaviors in students. You can't just... Uh, say this student is behaving this way because he is experiencing a trauma in his uh, past life experiences. Sometimes it's another thing, uh, as I've said, economic issues and other many other factors. So it depends on the learner and each, um, each uh, symptom needs to be treated differently. So it depends. Okay, thank you, Mariam. I think it was a clear explanation and clear um, answer to Mona's question. Let me just check if we have other questions to our speakers. Uh, all right. If you have any question, I'm addressing the audience. You can send it either in the Facebook page or here in YouTube chat. Okay, so there is a, a very important question that maybe uh, you all can answer it, all the speakers from Maha. She said, there is an, a very important issue, which is, uh, uh, which is the case of teaching adults. She, she said, in the case of teaching adults, shall we consider these students or what? do we have to take into account before planning a course for adults? Or planning a test for adults, again. Mohadis, she can also answer the question. We yeah, all know that- very interesting question. Yes, before teach, we all know that there is a difference in teaching different age groups. Teaching teenagers is not the same as kids, it's not the same as adults. So what do you think? Uh, mind you repeat your question again because I lost my internet connection. Uh, Mohadis, I think she's speaking, but I can't hear her. Can you hear me? Yeah, the, yes, Mohadis, the question is, uh, what things you have to take into consideration when you are teaching adults? Because it's not the same way when you are teaching children or teenagers. I think she has so bad internet the... connection. Yeah, she can't hear us. Yeah, now I can hear that. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, we can hear you. All right, thank you so much. Can you repeat the question one more time, please? Yes, sure. What are the things and factors uh, that we have to take into consideration, we as teachers, before planning a test or a lesson for adults? We all know that teaching age groups can be different. So kids is not the same as teenagers or adults. Yes, of course. For teenagers or sometimes kids, young learners, as we mentioned them, um, for young learners, normally we try to use more matching questions and we are going to have varieties of photos, pictures, and we want them to focus on their visual skills. We want them to listen to some parts and just tick or maybe match some parts. But for adults who are more kind of adept, and writing, listening, or reading some parts, we can have a variety of questions, either filling the blanks, or sometimes they can watch a film and give the summary of that as, the as their test. 
And for young learners, we need to uh, ask them to even sometimes to do some physical uh, actions. They can listen and they can jump, for example. They can listen and they can clap. Or some tests uh, that would kind of mm, ignore the kind of stress part. And we want them to be, for both of them, adults and even young learners, no matter, uh, we want them to be in a calm and quiet place. We do not want to put them under so many pressure of the testing or assessment. We want to show that how enjoyable it is to assess their skills and understand whether they need more uh, practice or not. Okay, yes uh good so does okay. anyone have another explanation or does anyone have another explain i mean if if anyone of you the speakers want to interact on the same question because um maha again she's saying shall should the teacher consider the adult student's psychological state? Probably this question is more addressed to Mariam. Yes, I think so too. Yes, as I've mentioned, sometimes some post past traumatic symptoms goes on uh, from uh, teenagers until adulthood. So it can you can, yes, you can uh, consider the psychological behavior of adults, but I think it's, um, it's easier to teach adults because they come with a focused um, goal in their mind. Not like teenagers, they're still in the age of uh, having troubles and they still don't know what they want to do and so on and so forth. Wonderful. Yeah. Wonderful. Good. Yes, it's a very uh, important question because you as a teacher, it's very essential to take into consideration the age of your learners. Because if you are teaching children, you have to know as a teacher that the children don't know that they are learning. They are not aware of learning. It's you who help them to learn. Now, if you are teaching adults, they are aware of what they are learning, what they are doing, it's number one. Number two, when we talk about motivation, motivating children is not the same like motivation adults. Children, they need more to be motivated each time, okay? They need to move, to act, to sit down, to stand up, to play roles all the time, unless they will lose and they will feel bored. Adults, you can motivate them from time to time, okay? Now, there's another difference between teaching children and adults Children somehow they are, uh, sorry, adults somehow they are self-motivated. They are coming to your classes to study, to learn the language, to get that certificate or to succeed, uh, to apply for a social job. Children, they are coming to your class, but they don't know. They are just coming for the sake of coming. They are not aware of what they are doing. Now, when we talk about sitting in class, an adult student can sit for more than two hours and it's okay for him or for her. Children, they cannot sit for more than 20 minutes. You should make them move. Can you imagine a child sitting for more than one hour? It's like punishment. Okay, so we have to take all these into account when we are teaching students. And students, or the student is a big word. Children, Juniors, adults, old people, etc. So these are very important questions we have to take. Then we can take another important element, which is the topics. Children, we can teach colors, animals, okay, hobbies. With adults, it's very important to talk about politics, sports, fashion, music, etc. So there are many things we have to take into account when we are teaching students. What do we mean by students? Children, juniors, or adults? Thank you. Okay, uh, can I add something? Yes, of course. Okay, we, we should also take into consideration the methods and approaches we use when teaching uh, 
children or adults. For uh, children, we should use uh, TPR, total physical response. And for adults, we uh, we are we should use uh, communicative language, and uh, we should um, create some situations, some real life situ situations to uh, uh, learn the language. Wonderful. Thank you. Wonderful. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, I agree with you. There are certain approaches and, and methods that can be only used for kids and can't be used or it's going to be challenging to use to be used with with adults and there are some some uh, that can be used uh, with with adults and can't be used with with kids okay so um i think this is it thank you yes, uh, yes do you have another question uh, mr hussein yeah, I want just to remind our international audience that Global Bus Foundation and the Chicasso Academy in collaboration with the Canadian Academy that we are going to organize, uh, uh, I mean, uh, new courses. One it's online via Zoom and the other one is in class. So next month in the beginning of um, November, it's gonna be the start of the 120 hour TEFL course. So they have the choice. If you are away from Rabat, the center, or away from Raqqa, you can take the, the I mean, the 100 TEFL, um, 100 hour TEFL course via Zoom. If you are next to Rabat and you can commute, you can come um, uh, and visit Rabat at the center there uh, at Academy. I mean, uh, so, sorry, to 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 Academy. And of course, by the end of the course, you become a certified teacher, and you can teach national. I mean, locally, nationally, and internationally. And what is interesting about our courses is that we focus more on practice. Yes, there is theory. But theory is not, uh, I mean, we don't focus more on theory, but the practice is the most important. We provide in the beginning with some theoretical parts and um, uh, after one or two or three weeks, then we move to a lot of practice because this is, this is what our trainees need in the future. Okay, yes, Islam. Yes, so you are all welcome to join us in the TEFL program, the TEFL course. Of course, you will have some qualified teacher trainers. Among them is Mr. Hussein Kasras. And um, uh, uh, it's the end of our seminar and our webinar for today. In its second edition, we had a first edition and it was a success. And our second edition, which is again a success, uh, because we have learned a lot from Mariam, from Yusuf, from uh, Muhadis, from Fatima Zahra, and from Mariam again. Thank you so much for uh, for your great, informative, insightful presentations and for your uh, uh, cheerful and funny and sometimes uh, um, amazing. I mean, they, they were just amazing presentations. I thank right. you all. I thank Mr. Hussein for... Um, his uh, attendance with us and for calling on me to moderate this event. It was a pleasure and uh, I'm very happy that we did it today. Uh, thank you so much. And uh, I thank our international and national audience for their questions, for their comments. I have here, um, I'm reading on YouTube and, and uh, Facebook and they have some very encouraging and motivating comments to all of us, to the speakers to GBF and to our course, TEFL uh, course. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, uh, our audience. And you are welcome in our next events. Inshallah, we are going to, in, uh, to organize uh, online and offline. Thank you so much and see you in our next event. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thanks, our great new teachers. We are proud of you. Thank you so much. Have a nice day. Goodbye.